Hello, and welcome to another episode of Solipsist Watched, where uh, this week I watched 1978's Dawn of the Dead. Um, so, why did I watch this film? Well, uh, I came to the realization that I had never seen this film in its entirety. Uh, this is the second film in what is generally referred to as the Living Dead series. Uh, it's a film by George A. Romero, who, um, well, is primarily known uh, for a variety of films, but especially this one. Um, like I said, this is a sequel. The first one is Night of the Living Dead, which I had seen before. Um, and this one I had seen parts of um, quite a few different times, but I don't think I had ever seen it in full. So I decided to sit down and watch it. And uh, it's it's an interesting one. Um, this is referred to, generally referred to under the, the cult classic moniker. It is a horror film, um, at least by with broad strokes, um, but it is very much not the type of horror film we see these days, nor the type of zombie film we see these days. Uh, if you are unaware. Um, zombie films, well, zombie films and zombie media have a long history, um, going back to the 19th century and even earlier, depending how you, how you count it. Um, there were a number of zombie films in the, uh, like early, early movies era, like, um, in the like twenties and thirties, um, that were much more focused on uh, the voodoo zombies. Um, and George Romero really was, uh, he's referred to as the, uh, the father of zombie films because, um, basically with night of the living dead and then dawn of the dead, um, he really revived and then redefined, uh, what a zombie film was and what zombies looked like in media. Um, some of you may have heard the term Romero zombies before that's named after him and the, these films, um, because he set essentially new definitions for, um, what zombies are, what they do, what their motivations are, so on and so forth. Um, and it's interesting to go back, especially with, uh, the, um, absolute pile of zombie media that we got in the, um, early 2000s through, well, just a few years ago, it seemed to taper off. We seemed to hit peak zombie and people gave up on it. Um, because pretty much all of the zombie media from that whole era, that like 15, 20 years, is uh, rather different um, in its tone and intention and usage, um, where zombies are much more treated as a as a monster rather than as a, a, a cinematic or a storytelling function. Um, so uh, Romero zombies are slow. They are afraid of fire. They um, have some intentionality. They don't, don't just like uh, wander around and only, um, only react to sound and stuff. Uh, they have, seem to have some, uh, some memory and, and basic, uh, mental function. Um, what's inter what's possible, well, where do I want to go with this first? What's possibly most interesting about this film is, um, that it is much more using the zombies as a, uh, something uh, as a setting, as a set piece and as something for, the actors to play against. Um, the film establishes itself in the middle of a, an ongoing um, zombie pandemic. And uh, I'll come back to it several times probably during this discussion, but um, this film is possibly more pertinent now than it ever has been <laughs> since its release. Um, and uh, in, in quite a few different ways. Um, but uh, with it it's establishing itself as uh, a world in which a zombie pandemic has broken out, it's being handled 
rather poorly in many ways, rather uh, rather well in others. Um, and it's just a lot of the movie is about people coping with uh, the realities and the horrors of um, that existence of a uh, existence where their um, their lives are threatened on a daily basis by a uh, a horror they can't defeat and that they are increasingly being worn down by. Um, and uh, it's really, in many ways, um, uh, more of a comedy. I mean, uh, Romero is somewhat known and um, somewhat known for his films being rather unsubtle social commentaries. Um, I would not use the word unsubtle. I think he there's a lot of subtlety in his in his work. Um, but, uh, that's, that's not to say that it hides, it hides the, the commentary that it's trying to have. Um, and it's really interesting, um, again, how much is more pertinent now than possibly ever. Um, the, uh, criticism of, um, a, great many social topics, um, not the least of which is um, uh, hyper-consumerism and uh, economic disparity and, uh, you know, racial tension and, like, racist, uh, racial injustice and police brutality and all these things that Um, having not seen the whole film before, I was not as keyed in on, um, but are shockingly pertinent for this time and place. Um, the film's plot meanders a bit. Um, but again, I don't, that's no, that's not really a problem. Much of the film, like I said, is really about watching a a few characters, um, explore and and try and handle the world around them um both the existential threat and direct threat of um the zombie hordes that you know are persistently trying to kill them in one way or another um uh, and the adaptations that they have to make to continue to live um but also in a in a very overarching sense um the greater threat being uh the man's inhumanity against man um the failure of um humans to uh work together to agree to to make concessions to um come to uh consensus when you know things are on the line um, but also the overt, uh, the the overt horrors that can be committed um, by humans against other humans. Um, that's really a, a core a core theme um, in my mind. Um, so as a as a horror film, as a film from the 70s, it is deeply steeped in a set like late 70s, 80s, early 80s aesthetic. Um, again, this is, you know, it's it's uh, a social critique in many ways, and it's a critique of the 70s, but it also sort of it deeply embeds itself in, in that, that era. I mean, that's, I su- suppose, natural. Hard to critique it if you're not right in there. But... Um, the uh you know the there's still how do how do i want to do this without uh getting too much into the plot um the the cast is shockingly diverse for the era um that is not to say that this should be touted as some sort of you know um uh incredibly self-aware or or um something that holds up in every single way um in this era but for something that came out you know uh 
still closely in the aftermath of, um, uh, you know, the civil rights era and all those sorts of things, um, seeing this many not, uh, non-white and non-male, uh, actors on screen, um, both in leading roles and in general is, uh, refreshing, I guess is the only word I can use for it. Cause it's a reflection of, um, at, at the same time as it's a very, uh, very much a character study and very focused on a couple of certain individuals. Um, it takes a broad, such a broad look at, um, American society as a whole in that era, um, and in general that, um, having the cast reflect that, um, really adds a lot of depth to, um, the analysis, the critique, whatever you want to call it. Um, it, it being that it is so deeply steeped in, in the seventies, the fashions and the architecture and, uh, everything about it is very much, you know, it's, I don't want to say dated because that, uh, you know, adds too much of a negative connotation, but it is, if, if you can't handle, you know, like, yes, this is the era that we're, that, that we're viewing. If, if that bothers you, if you watch old movies and that you can't like just sort of be steeped in that, then that might be a distraction for some individuals. Um, uh, but there's so much style and, um, every bit of, uh, every shot is, um, nothing looks generic. Let's, let's, I'll talk about the, the cinematography a little bit, I guess. Um, which is that Romero is not an incredibly, I don't want, I don't want to detract from him in any way, but the, he's not an incredibly talented, um, filmmaker, like director, cinematographer. Um, but he is extremely competent. Um, his, uh, shots are well composed, um, well framed. Um, as I think I mentioned, uh, in one of the previous reviews, it might've been, it might've been during, um, uh, uh, knives out um you know it's a case where it's the fundamentals are clearly there he understands how to um frame his shots or or he and or the the dp um are good framing good uh good the like, camera direction good mix of um fixed uh and moving shots um uh you know long shots, lens choices done pretty carefully, even though this is a relatively cheap film. Um, a, a lot of care was clearly put in, um, to getting things right. And the editing also reflects that, um, where, uh, it's not like he's not going for anything incredibly impressive, but it is very consistent. Um, and the, the shot to shot, uh, tempo um is kept very consistent and that can have a very um strong effect on how a movie feels uh, a movie that is you know cut hectically feels hectic um and so having him shoot and edit in such a deliberate um uh, with a, such a deliberate tempo uh, adds sort of a, a, a more distinct um, feeling to to the story he's trying to tell. Uh, this is not a horror film in the way um, a lot of modern horror films are, where you're like you're up and then you're down, and you're up and you're down. It's like um, that. That's not the that's not the horror he goes for. Um, so that's really appreciated as sort of a, a moderating factor as well as uh, just technically well executed. Um, the actors themselves uh, and the the dialogue is not incredible, um, but all very serviceable. Um, 
the the actors themselves play their parts extremely well. Um, many of the actors have uh, careers after the fact, but not not really substantial ones. Um, again, this was a bit of a, mi- a rather minor film at the time. Um, very successful, but um, you know, in the grand scheme of uh, things that we're releasing. Um, you know, it, it was an, it's, it's a horror film in the seventies. It's niche. Um, it's fundamentally niche. And, uh, yeah, I mean, $1.5 million is not nothing. Um, but, uh, you know, even in 78, it's not a lot of money to spend on a film. Um, that said, we should probably talk about some of the production uh, things because I think they're important both in a meta sense and as a direct their direct effect on the film. So the version of the film that I watched um, was the, I believe, the original release, uh, quote unquote, extended cut or director's cut um, that was cut for the Cannes Film Festival by Romero. Um, the theatrical release is, uh, 22 minutes shorter, um, I believe. And, um, I don't know. I, I, I've read a little bit, so I know a little bit, but I don't know all what was cut out. Um, supposedly some of the, uh, there's a bit of a tone shift because they cut out some of the content that is, um, more comedic, um, although calling it comedic is, I, I, I feel like the mix of tones in the film actually works really well. Um, the alternation between, um, the horror aspects and the comedic aspects and the dramatic aspects, um, are all really well balanced. So I'd be surprised if I thought that the, uh, cut that removed that was, um, or remove some of that was better. Um, although, you know, I'm willing, willing to be surprised. Um, this, uh, this film also had, uh, a lot of, uh, Romero worked closely with, um, Italian filmmaker Dario Argento, um, who is, uh, a rather prolific filmmaker in his own right. Um, probably most well known for, uh, Suspiria, not whatever remake they made recently, uh, whatever that was, was, uh, well, I didn't see it, but apparently it was garbage, um, and which is no surprise because um, I can't fathom making Suspiria in a modern, in a modern way. Um, Suspiria is a fantastic film that everybody should see as well, I think. But um, yeah, Dario Argento is, um, was pretty well known as, a, as an Italian filmmaker and as a horror filmmaker. Um, and had a lot of influence on, uh, some of the aspects of how this was made, but also collaborated with, um, a, a band that he, the, uh, a band called Goblin that he, um, had worked with many times previously, um, for the soundtrack, uh, to Dawn of the Dead. Unfortunately, the cut that I watched and the all of the Amer- all of the US releases to my knowledge up until very recently um, use did mostly did not use um, Goblin soundtrack uh, um, there are a couple of a tr- uh, couple of Goblin tracks in this cut and in the theatrical cut um, but a lot of the soundtrack is, from uh, a stock audio bank um, from us, you know, whatever the studio was. Um, and mostly it's fine. Um, but there are some outliers that are like real bad. Um, probably wouldn't have been as bad at the time, um, but have been reused. Um, there is one outstanding um one that I think even at the time would have been really bad, which is actually right during the ending. There's a track that's used that is wildly inappropriate, if you ask me. Um, 
I would really like to. Uh, so, um, Argento owned or owns the rights or a substantial part of the rights to this film and did several re-edits and re-releases of this film, including um, the original international release, um, which is a different film cut, but also uses the, uh, the complete um, uh, Goblin soundtrack. One day, I'd probably like to re-watch this film um, with... I'd like to rewatch the international edition um, because you can tell in in this cut, you can tell which tracks are the Goblin tracks and they are fantastic, um, really stand out. Uh, so hearing the entire thing scored by them is something I'm very interested in experiencing. Um, but that's a... A, a, a project for another day. Um, yeah, uh, I guess aside from that, I'm, I've been reflecting a little bit on it and, and the, the, what this film means in the modern era, uh, what films, um, aped it or, or tried to, um, replicate it or, uh, you know, took, uh, inspiration from it. Um, obviously there have been a couple of spin-off series, either, uh, in, in, you know, either spoof spin-offs or, um, like direct you know, intent, uh, like, and I'm talking about the ones not made by, um, Romero. Um, there's been some spoof spin-offs. There've been some like direct spin-offs. There have been a whole bunch of remakes. Uh, uh this, this film was, remade big fucking air quotes on that um in i believe 2004 um by zach snyder i believe hold on i gotta check that um yeah 2004 zach snyder uh yeah i have really no interest in doing that except for sort of a morbid curiosity um the only the only uh, thing that really makes me a little bit more curious is because it was apparently written by James Gunn, who is an interesting character in his own right, especially as um, prior to his uh, uh, recent um, fame and elevation to you know doing Marvel films. Uh, he was making trauma films for a long time, which if you're familiar with trauma. Um, that's a whole other topic for another day. Anyway, uh, I apparently, I don't really have a lot of interest in seeing the 2004 film, but I'm a little curious if anybody's seen it and has a particular feeling one way or another on it. Um, I'd be happy to hear your, hear your thoughts. Um, but the, the film that actually I was thinking about the most, um, after finishing it, um, was probably 28 Days Later, which is a film uh, I watched a long time ago, and I've watched a couple of times, um, and I quite like. It's got a few issues, but um, has a very similar sort of, um, uh, you know, character focus and small scope in small scope in a big scope uh, type of, you know, double view. Um, and yeah, I, I, like, I don't want to say a lot more about it, both because I think people should watch 28 days later, but I think people should also watch this one. I don't want to spoil either of them. Um, yeah. The only other thing I have to say about, uh, Dawn of the Dead really has to do with the ending. Um, let's see if I can do this without talking about the ending itself. The ending that is in this film is not the ending they originally intended. Um, and I don't particularly like the ending and the ending that they supposedly were going to have before they were, uh, told not to after, um, you know, screenings or something like that. Uh, the ending they were talking about seems like it would have been more in keeping with the tone. Um, and, more appropriate for for the film as a whole um 
we'll never know. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting thing to know happened. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, it's a good film. It's cheesy. I, I will say, I mean, it's a cheap horror movie from the 70s, so all the things that go with that sort of all the things you would think go with that sort of go with that. Um, but it in many ways holds up quite well and is absolutely worth watching if you haven't. Um, so yeah, I recommend it anyway. Thank you guys for watching another episode of this. Uh, leave your comments below and your thoughts. Um, let me know what you think about this film or Romero or Argento or, um, you know, any of the sequels, spinoffs, uh, inheritors of the mantle so on and so forth um uh and and we can chat about it um yeah so uh thank you again and i will see you guys next time